steam locomotives in miniature at the steam workshop. This is part 12, fitting the brakes and cleaning out the cylinder drain cocks. On this particular small locomotive, which is a Chubb 5 inch gauge 040 type, the brakes are non functional. They're there because they look good, but there isn't a brake actuating lever and there isn't a brake column and there's no way of putting the brakes onto the wheels. But they still have to be in place and here I am refitting them. It would be a very simple job to put the lay shaft in with the brake actuating levers and put a brake column in there, but I'm not going to bother because I'm just rebuilding this locomotive as it was before it was parked up in a barn for many years. This is one of the more fiddly jobs, it's a very simple job, I'm just tightening this bolt that holds the brake hangers in place on the shaft that's mounted on the chassis. But the head of the bolt is quite thin and it's difficult to get the spanner to be in the right place at any given time. I wouldn't be having this problem if I was using my back or adjustable spanner with the extra wide jaws, but it's a little bit too big and cumbersome to get into this space, hence the use of the smaller spanner. The steam that you keep seeing wafting over the front of the screen is just my cup of tea by the front of the engine. You get plenty of cups of tea at Steam Workshop, I can really recommend it. Fitting the rear brake hanger is somewhat simpler because I can use a socket, there's not a cylinder in the way, but I still have to use this small spanner to finish the job off and make sure that it's tight. I don't want these brakes to dangle about because they will eventually hit the wheel. So once I've fitted these, these are the brake arms that go between the spring hangers and are connected together, I'm going to lock up the entire mechanism so it can't move. So that the ends of these parts fitted into the spring hangers, I've cleaned them up using a piece of emery cloth. And I'm using some oil because I don't want them to rust solid because if they're not going to move, they could just go rusty. But at least with some oil on there, there's less chance of that happening. This is a very small and somewhat insignificant part of the rebuild that got overlooked. There is a sheared off bolt in the frames at the front. This is one of the bolts that holds the guard irons in place. The reason for fitting guard irons to a locomotive, whether it be a full size or a model, is to kick things out of the way that would normally be run over by the wheel and risk derailment. And at some stage this guard iron must have hit something pretty hard to shear the bolt off at the front. Anyway, it's coming out easy enough with my small pair of angle pliers, and this is all that remains of a 4BA bolt. I'll fit the guard irons later, they're relatively unimportant, but this on the other hand is very important. These are the drain holes underneath the cylinder that allow water to drain from the cylinder when the engine first sets off, and all of them are blocked. The drain cocks that fit in these holes are operated from the cab, and they open and shut to let the condensate out of the cylinders to prevent hydraulic lock when the engine first sets off. The larger outer hole is threaded 3 16ths by 40 threads per inch, but the small hole that goes through into the cylinder on these cylinders is completely blocked. I tried a piece of wire, followed by a very fine drill. The only practical solution was to drill out the holes using a drill bit fitted in the electric drill. I've been very, very careful with this because if the drill snaps off, then I really do have a problem. A couple of points on this before any viewers raise a couple of points on this. Yes, I know I'm drilling a hole into a cylinder where there's a piston. I've obviously moved the piston out of the way. Oh, but what about all those metal particles in the cylinder? Not a problem. The first steam that gets into the cylinder will blow out all the metal particles. Plus, before I continue and fit the drain cocks, I'm going to run the engine up and down the bench while simultaneously pumping lots of oil into the cylinder to flush out these particles of metal. First of all though, I'm using a cotton bud to clean them out. I used about 15 of these cotton buds, it took quite a while to clean up the holes in the cylinders. Three down and one to go. I'm really hoping that Sod's Law, Murphy's Law or the Chaos Theory doesn't come into play and the drill breaks off. No, I must think positive about this one. It's not always the last part of the job that goes wrong, and this one didn't. This was the least blocked of the holes into the cylinder. So once again, using yet another cotton bud or three or four, I thoroughly cleaned every one of these holes in the bottom of the cylinders. And now it's time to look at the drain cocks themselves. You have to be careful when fitting these things because they are handed, they're designed to go in a specific place. And that's because the lever in the cab moves the linkage and the linkage arm moves the small arm on each of the drain cocks, but they only open in one direction. 
the other direction is closed, so if you put them on wrong, you'll get some opening and some closing. You have to make sure you have them all in the correct position, and the best way to do this is to blow through them. But nobody's going to blow through these because they're completely blocked from top to bottom. So the first thing to do is to use a piece of wire. And no, this doesn't get through at all. This is really solid stuff that's in there. It's a combination of rust, general grime, dirt and filth and bits and pieces, dead rats, mice, and who knows what else is in there. So I'm really not in any rush to put this in my mouth and blow through it. When I finally get them clear, I think I'll just hold them up to the light and look through them. And if I can see daylight, then that will be a good thing. On one of the drain cocks, I did actually manage to poke the wire all the way through, but it wasn't a very good fix, it just bored a hole through the filth inside. So once again, I did have to resort to a drill, but I didn't use the electric drill for these. I did it the manual method, which meant using a very small twist drill, and I found one of these on John's workbench. So I poked the small twist drill through each of the drain cocks and unblocked them. Then I put them in a bowl of cellulose thinners and stirred them up thoroughly with an old paintbrush. And for viewers not in the UK, cellulose thinners is also known as lacquer thinner. And while I'm on the subject of things that are not in the UK, I'd like to thank John from Ontario in Canada for sending me a collection of very, very useful small steam parts. Thanks, John. I do appreciate that. These are the guard irons that fit at the back and at the front of the locomotive, which are used to deflect anything from the rails that could derail the engine. When I first saw these, I thought, what's all this damage? But it isn't damage that's been done in service, it was damage done by somebody grinding away part of the guard irons to fit them in the right place. I'm having a quick check to see if anything's fouling. No, the brake hangers are in the right place. Where the eccentric rod mounts onto the expansion link at one side of the engine, the nut is very, very close to the crosshead. And I was a little bit concerned that this nut holding the pin in place might just collide with the crosshead as the motion goes back and forth. So the solution to that was to turn it round and machine the head of the pin a little bit thinner so everything clears. Last week and part of this week at the steam workshop there's been a lot of activity, mainly putting steel racking in place so that the engines can be put on this racking using a forklift truck. And the only convenient time that I got last week was to take this footage. This is John silver soldering a couple of bushes into a pansy boiler. This is a 5-inch gauge model of a Great Western Railway pannier tank, and it's called Pansy, as in pannier. I think it's meant to be some sort of a pun. I didn't really have time to talk to John about this because he was very busy. The other flame you can see is being held by Simon. So the flame on the right heats up the boiler in this area, and then the oxypropane torch that John has takes the temperature up even higher, but only in a very small controlled area around the bushes. You've probably noticed John keeps feeding in some more silver solder so that the bushes become firmly attached to the boiler shell. And now for something completely and utterly different. I'm re-threading the holes in the frames because they were a little bit damaged. I'm using a 4BA tap and there's not really enough room to get a tap wrench in so I'm using my Barco spanner. Yet another example of why every workshop should have a Barco spanner. Barco spanners like this are excellent for a great variety of different jobs. In the past, on occasion, I've used them as a micrometer, would you believe? Some people tell me off for using adjustable spanners, but no, I will always argue that they are essential. If you're into steam locomotives, you always need to have one in your pocket, because you never know which thread size you're going to need. And sometimes, in the case of an emergency where you quickly need to remove a union nut for some reason, a Barco spanner is the answer. I have a tobacco tin full of very small spanners and I have these in my toolbox that I take with me to the steam workshop. And the most useful spanners in my toolbox are, well apart from the Barco adjustable spanner, these really cheap ones that I get from Blackgate's engineering. These spanners are laser cut from a piece of stainless steel and all I have to do is separate the spanners because they're all joined together in the middle. And once you do that you've got a fine set of spanners that will do this. The ring spanners are really useful. The open-ended spanners that are at 90 degrees are even more useful. In fact, they will get into spaces where normal spanners won't. It's inevitable when working on an old steam locomotive like this 
that the paint is going to get damaged during reassembly. So what I generally do is repaint the parts using a paintbrush. And once the paint's dried, you can't tell it's ever been done. That's it for this episode. Thanks for watching and I hope you found it useful.